wondering why we're sitting in this kindergarten setup. Um, it's all about innovation now. So <laughs> we were asked to, to sit here, right? Um, and as Rainer mentioned before, you have quite a success story, but let me introduce this man who was addressed a lot of times today already. Again, this is Guillaume Marie Jean Dominique Fourie. <laughs> uh, he's a physicist, an aerospace engineer, test pilot with more than 1,300 flight hours, which didn't change for the last 20 years, I have That's to true. say. So, um, he studied at the usual French elite schools and started his storybook career as a helicopter expert right at Airbus, and he was always loyal to Airbus. There was only this brief detour to Peugeot, which we owe some beautiful details of the Peugeot 308, right? So some of the aerospace details in the, in the car are your work. So five years ago, almost five years ago, he uh, became Airbus CEO, and we just checked uh, Airbus has been about the world's biggest commercial plane maker for the last five years, increasingly outshining its competitor Boeing. And let's start, so welcome again, Guillaume. Thank you. Uh, we start with a little game. I read a sentence to you, and you have to find the number of paradoxes, like strange contradictions in it, yeah? Please count. I read the sentence now. Airbus is a highly functional European project. Zero. Which is really strange. Cooperatively initiated by Germany, France, and Spain. Second paradox. Which as a European high-tech company has managed to outclass its major American competitor. Third paradox. Almost never happens. And emerged stronger from the crisis of the pandemic. So I was wondering, with all these strange circumstances, do you wake up sometimes in the morning and think about, so think yourself, um, how did this all happen? Why are we successful at all? It just isn't, it can't be true, right? Well, we're looking forward more than backwards, but you're right, it's important to understand why we're successful. And I think it comes down to uh, maybe a small number of, uh, of things. Long time ago, some uh, people with very strong um, political will and vision excellent engineers and entrepreneurs coming together with a project that was a crazy project at that time. Uh, but I think the, the today's main factors for success are the, the following, and let's look at commercial aviation. I like to say, um, if we had today one aircraft manufacturer in Germany, one aircraft manufacturer in France, one aircraft manufacturer in the UK, and one in Spain, there would be none, there would be zero. Mm -hmm. We are what we are today because uh, we've come together and we've created the scale for this industry that is big enough to compete with our uh, American friends and competitors. Uh, we're in industries where scale is important, huge investment, a uh, lot of skills and technologies which are involved, and a rather small number of products. So if you're subscale, it's extremely difficult to make it. If you are at the right scale together, well, we have proven that we can make it, and we can make it over time. And actually, there are few other fields where, as Europeans, we manage to do this. Um, and one frustration is really that in defense, we're really struggling to be doing this at a time where defense and security, as we've, we've heard already, uh, is so critical. Mm. But I would say it's a lot of factors. Obviously, it's not down to one, but the fact that we have accepted, as Europeans, uh, to share the, uh, the sovereignty uh, in terms of commercial aviation 40 years ago has, over time, led to the, the conditions for being strong, for being competitive, for being innovative, because we have fantastic skills in Europe. Mm. But we are, most of the time, missing that scale when competition is with big players in the US or to more in Asia and in China, for instance. Mm. If you turn that around for a moment, so, if the thing, so you are obviously a successful running European project. What could the project of Europe learn from Airbus? I think it's, um, it's quite simple, is what I tried to, to share in my uh, previous answer. Um, as long as we remain fragmented, 
we are subscale. Uh, scale is not important and critical in all industries. But today, more and more, with technology, with innovation, it requires huge amount of investment. Subscale means you can't make it. As Europeans, we are the largest uh, market in the world. The economies together, I mean, we have the number three or four, we have the number five or six, and so on. Europe is the biggest uh, market in the world, and we are the biggest player when it comes to the capability of uh, um, delivering sophisticated products. But, but we have to come down to that scale. We need to be able to, or um, are willing to abandon a bit of national sovereignty for the sake of European sovereignty. Mm. Abandon a bit of the, the idea of national success against other nations of Europe for the success of Europe in the world. I think that's really what is at stake, at least in the fields of business where we are working, which is commercial aviation, defense, security, helicopters. It has become somewhat of a sport in newsrooms to count um, incidents involving Boeing airplanes these days. So we have to bo talk about Boeing. I was asking you before, can we talk about Boeing? And we were like, yeah, let's try. So how do we respond to people afraid of, to board an airplane these days? You know, with uh, video footage from the Alaska Airlines, everyone saw that. And how, how, what do you tell people who are afraid? I will not answer that question directly, but I will say a few words. First, we are obviously in an industry where quality and safety is the top priority. That's absolutely clear. And we have managed as an industry over time to become the safest mode of transport by far, not by a little. Okay? Uh, there are something like 1.5 million fatalities on the roads in the world every year. Uh, aviation that transports uh, more than 4 billion passengers a year uh, comes down to a very small number. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it's dozens. So this industry delivers a very safe mode of transport overall. But what is interesting is the less accident we have, the less each and every accident acceptable, which is good news for passengers. Um, the, uh, the aviation is attracting a lot of attention on the safety. That's good but it's a lot of pressure. So what I take as a, as a learning for us, for Airbus, is humility, no complacency. And I'm not um, happy of the problems of my competitor because that's not something good for the industry as a whole. And we really want, as Airbus, to make sure we learn all the lessons from our own issues, but also from the ones of others. So these are opportunities to learn, to continue to improve, and continue to do better. In an environment that is a difficult one, uh, we are with supply chains that are really disrupted by what happened during COVID and have not yet recovered from what happened uh, four years ago. At Airbus, we're still producing by far less planes than we were producing in 2019 when we were hit by the pandemic. Mm. So this industry has not yet recovered, and that's something that we have to take very, very serious. You are booked out until the end of the decade at least, right? So there's a lot of pressure on you to deliver planes, to ship faster, do night shifts, for example. You never would do that, right? Oh, of course we have night shifts, yes, of course. Yes, and what do you do about So how can you guarantee in this high-pressure environment to have all the security in place? Mm -hmm. Which is obviously a major problem in the Boeing outlets. What is important for us is, first and foremost, to deliver planes which are according to the quality standards we have and we're committed to, and that can be operated safely, just to be very clear. Uh, in 2021, we redefined a ramp-up plan out of COVID uh, that was counting on uh, around 720 aircraft being delivered in 2022. And we failed because the supply chains were not ready. So we just had to recognize that the speed of ramp up, that the situation of the supply chain, uh, the teams, the people, the hiring, the supply of uh, raw material, the logistics around the world was not where we wanted it to be. So we had to revise our plans, slow down, and we adapted to the real situation. So we have to face reality, not what we want, but what the situation really is. And I think that's very close to what we heard already this morning. We have to adapt to the reality, face the reality. Mm. If you need to travel from Paris to Frankfurt, you're going from Paris to Frankfurt, train or plane? Depends. 
depends. I like the idea that we have different modes of transport. We can take the best out of uh, it. And um, I could have answered precisely for other destinations where I am used to travel by train or travel by plane. Um, most of the time, the competition is not necessarily between train and, and uh, plane. When there is a good railway system in place, that's very nice. So you could you take the TGV three I hours, do. 43 minutes from, from Paris to, to I Paris. do take the TGV quite often to the west of France or to the southeast. That works very well. Mm -hmm. As a bus of Airbus, I do take the, the train. I think it's a, it's a very good mode of transport. But I think you're going to something else. Yes, there's this plan <laughs> for short-haul short flights these days. So France established one. I think Spain is in the discussion of doing the same. So if there, there's a time span of two and a half hours, you shouldn't use planes. You can't use planes. It's forbidden in France now. Do you think that that's a problem for your business? Well, I think it's dogmatic. I think it doesn't fit with the, the reality and the economic reality that, that we're in. And uh, most of the time, plane is not in competition with train. It's in competition with car. And that's, that's done on the, on the back of carbon emissions. Well, actually, if you fly a commercial plane from Paris to Toulouse, there are by far less carbon emissions than if you do it by car, except if you are four in your car. So it's very dogmatic. Uh, this, is, this is political. This is not uh, what engineers would do uh, looking at uh, facts and figures. Therefore, I don't like it. I'm completely against these kind of measures. But I'm not suggesting we should not decarbonize aviation. Of course, that's the top priority that is in front of us. And that's what Airbus has engaged very strongly in 2019. And we want to lead the industry for the decarbonization of aviation. But the mode of transport that aviation represents is a great mode of transport. You don't need an infrastructure on the ground. So you'll need to damage the ecosystems that we pretend to protect by reducing carbon emissions. And that's something I think the bigger picture of this is not very well represented. Mm. Did you? Did you expect yourself, so many experts were surprised when we had this explosion in demand globally after the pandemic. So everyone's, and, and Boeing is really struggling, you are really struggling to deliver, to ship. Um, so, so have you been surprised? And can you explain why this happens at all? After yeah. all this Fridays for Future discussions we had in so, Europe. So I think this discussion is very European, oh. very West Europe European discussion. If you look at the broader world, the, the appetite for traveling, for moving on the planet, is very strong. And in emerging countries, they're just at the beginning. I think we're at the very beginning of aviation. There's no other um, mode of transport uh, that has so little externalities than aviation. Carbon is the exception. Uh, so we need to deal uh, with the, the carbon matter. Uh, but you don't need an infrastructure. Actually, the infrastructure is the air. It's completely natural. You don't, you don't need to damage each and every kilometer on the way between A to B. So aviation provides a very fast, efficient, and safe mode of transport. Now, I will come to your point. Um, I have been surprised by the robustness of the backlog of Airbus, the number of planes we have contracted during COVID. The airlines have been working very hard to not let their slots, their production slots, go to others. Yes. Why? Um, There's some dealing going on in the background all the time about these slots, right? No, no but that's not the point I'm trying to make. Um, and probably less than right. what you think. <laughs> uh, why is it so strong? Uh, because um, this industry is growing. So first, there is a growth to serve. Uh, but this industry is also looking at its competitiveness and its impact on climate. And when you buy a modern plane, the one that is for sale today, you have a very strong alignment between economical interest and ecological interest. If, when you buy a plane that burns 20 to 40 percent less fuel than the one it's replacing, you are by far more uh, competitive and you are by far more uh, protective of the environment. We have a strong alignment for the planes. And for the other ways of decarbonizing, for instance, going to sustainable aviation fuel, you don't have this strong alignment. So for airlines, it's a no-brainer that you're much more competitive and, and pro I mean, prepared for the future, decarbonized world, if you have a modern plane rather than if you have an old one. And that's true for us and for the competitor. And that's why we see so much demand um, in a world where we see aviation on the rise again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the products of your company are responsible, if I'm not mistaken, for something like 1% of global carbon output per year. That could be right. So air travel would be something like 2.4%. Half of the fleet is yours. So 1% is, is on your bill for, for carbon, right? So I was wondering, what's your perspective um, on long-haul flights, especially, which are 70% of this output? Mm. When will we see a substantial decarbonization or zero emission flights on this planet? 250, 235, what's your vision? Mm. And with so, what kind of fuel, yeah, yeah. if you... Uh, you allow me a long answer to yes, this one? Please. I think we're really at the uh, core. Yeah. Six minutes and 20 yeah, seconds. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you're touching important points. Um, Airbus, as a company, um, as a scope one, scope two emission, so the, the emission, the carbon emission of Airbus as a company, that is less than one million ton. So that's actually quite small compared to the figures we are mentioning. But what we call the scope three, which is the emissions of our customers, of our airplanes in service, is indeed half of the uh, aviation emissions. And aviation is indeed 2 to 2.5% of the carbon emissions of the world. 50 gigaton of carbons, 1 gigaton for uh, aviation, and if you cut by 2, the scope 3, okay, the carbon that our customers are emitting by burning fuel in our planes in one year, that's indeed uh, roughly uh, half a gigaton, so 500 million tons. That's a great responsibility, that's also a great opportunity. Mm. Because if we find the right way to decarbonize, and we think that's where we are, uh, we can not only influence the 8% of emissions of aviation in Europe, we can influence 50% of the world uh, aviation emission, and why not more if we have a bigger market share, which we think uh, we can achieve. That's what we're doing today with the, the single line. What's the way to get there? Um, uh, actually, we are in the fourth revolution of aviation. The first one was to make planes fly. The second one was to make them fly safely. The third one was to democratize, and that's what we have done. It's very cheap now to fly uh, with planes. And the fourth one is to decarbonize. How do we do this? First, um, we have to replace the current planes that are burning a lot of fuel by planes which are burning by far less fuel. That's why we have so much demand. That's what we're doing now. You're good at that. And those planes, and those planes uh, are already certified today for 50% of sustainable aviation fuel in the mix of uh, jet fuel in the, in the tanks of the plane. So we can go up to 50% of SAF with the current planes. The next stage is to develop a new generation of planes that will burn again 20, 25, maybe 30% less fuel um, and uh, certified for 100% of sustainable aviation fuel. That's the trajectory. And the ultimate way to fly will be uh, not flying with SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, where you take carbon from the air and you put it back in the air when you burn the SAF in the plane, but it's to fly with hydrogen, because when you use hydrogen on board, there's zero carbon, and if you put it in a fuel cell, there's no emissions at all. And we will come to the market for the first time with a hydrogen plane by 2035. So today, there are different types of challenges. One is on the technology of the planes themselves. We will do it. We know how to do it. This will happen. The other part is the SAF. As I explained earlier, a, a plane that is burning less fuel is more competitive. Airlines are buying them. Unfortunately, that's the opposite for the sustainable aviation fuel. A SAF is more expensive today than a jet fuel. Therefore, uh, if you are ahead of the others in burning SAF, you are less competitive. And here we need the regulatory framework to encourage, to twist the situation so the SAF becomes the way forward, and then we will see production and consumption rising. And that's where we have difficulties today. Uh, we have a lot of challenges, and we have decided at Airbus to play a role of catalyst for the industry. We partner with a lot of players to accelerate the ramp-up of sustainable efficient fuels. We would need a global framework to do this, because it's all about level playing field. And unfortunately, that's not what we have today. We have regulation by, uh, by regions, 
Europe is going with uh, a very constraining regulatory framework and taxes. We're in Europe. The US are going with uh, incentives. China is going with a, a, a vision for the country and a very top-down approach, but that's not going to work at scale, so we need to continue to work together. The recent steps last year with ICAO uh, were very positive, but still that's the most challenging part of what we have to do. And to your question, I think on the short haul and the single aisle, we'll get there quite quickly. Mm. On the long haul, we will have to rely a lot on sustainable aviation fuel, and we are far from where we want to be. The roadmap for aviation, that is the industry roadmap, that has been supported by the countries of the world at ICAO two years ago, is to be carbon neutral by 2050. We, have, we know how to get there. There's a credible trajectory, but it comes with huge investment, and investment will be coming if the frame is clear and stable. And that's not yet the case, but uh, the world is making progress in that direction, and I am day by day more optimistic on the speed at which we will get there on the fuels. There has to be something like a Tesla moment at some point in time in air travel, right? Where suppliers of technology totally switch their technology to, to other fuels and stuff like that. The whole infrastructure has to change. And it's, it's a little bit like in the car industry, maybe. Uh, some, some years ago, and nobody was expecting that, and suddenly it flipped. And what's your kind of strategic plan to, you, you have all these suppliers, you have this terrible, terrible supply chain, you have to change everything. How do you do that? Mm. So, we will judge the Tesla moment with more hindsight, okay? Um, but still, still, they've been a big disruptor of the industry. And um, a lot of car makers didn't believe in um, electric mobility. Well, we have to come to the conclusion that there is a place for electromobility. Uh, electromobility for us, um, I mean, or disruption for us, is in our view the hydrogen plane. A hydrogen plane is the disruption in the sense of completely getting rid of the only remaining issue for aviation, which is carbon emissions. Uh, but it's a very different fuel with very different characteristics. Why do we believe in hydrogen? Because um, flying is all about weight in the air. You have to pay a very high energetic price for one kilogram in the air. Therefore, it's all about weight reduction. Um, jet fuel, the traditional fuel we are using, uh, has 12,000 watt hours per kilogram. 12,000 units of energy per kilogram. A battery, is, is uh, 200 to 500, maybe one day 1,000 watt hours compared to 12,000. That doesn't work for us. But hydrogen has 33,000 watt hours per kilogram. So it's a, it's a fuel with huge energy density per kilogram. Well, hydrogen is not used today in aviation. Uh, you need to store it in a tank that needs to be um, uh, isolated because you need to be at minus 253 degrees to store your liquid hydrogen on board. That's what we do on rockets, on, to some extent on satellites. We need to bring it to aviation. That's what we're doing. We are convinced at Airbus that we will master the technologies to be on the market by 2035 with a small hydrogen plane, and others are already uh, working on it on smaller, uh, on smaller planes. Uh, the issue is we need as well a regulatory framework for hydrogen planes. And this is not existing today, so we have to embark with us a lot of people to create that regulatory framework. And we will need, and that's probably the bigger challenge, uh, enough green hydrogen at the airport in 2035, at the right place, at the right price, at the right quantity, and that's another challenge. And we're coming back to the real challenge, in my view, of the decarbonization, which is the energy transition. Today, the world is using 80% of its energy is coming from fossil fuels, 80%. If we want to be decarbonized by 2050, this 80%, that is huge. Aviation is just a small part of it, needs to become decarbonized. We want to go to SAF first, and for long on the white bodies, and then to hydrogen, which is another sustainable aviation fuel. We have the roadmap, but we need the bigger ecosystem to want to get there and not want to oppose, or delay, or tax, or doubt. No, as I said before, we need action. We have an action plan, and we want and need to have a lot of supporters to help aviation get there, because then we have the ultimate mode of transport on the planet. 
an airport at the beginning, an airport at the end. You can connect all points. You don't need an infrastructure. It's the air. We get kill signs already. I'm just stealing if you get five more minutes because I had two last Tesla moment questions for you. We didn't address the fact that you are also really big in defense, right? Thank you. It's the second part of your business, which is a major chunk. And just one question, because we addressed that on stage before, and Mr. Zeitenwende was here. Um, so Europe increased its budget in the last 20 years for defense, maybe 20%. Um, Russia, maybe um, 300 percent, China, 600 percent, something like that. What would you recommend for Europe? So I'm, I know this is, you know, <laughs> not an easy task for you to, to navigate. How big of a budget would we need for Europe to keep up with this development? Um, indeed, we are a, a security and defense player, and that's really at the core of, um, of what um, Airbus uh, stands for. Uh, we're actually the biggest defense player in the EU. And number two, if we take uh, the bigger Europe with the uh, BA system being uh, bigger than us in defense. And actually, that share of Airbus is very small compared to the rest. That speaks for defense in Europe being very small compared to what it is in the US or in China or in Russia. Actually, let me make uh, one uh, important point to, to respond to your question. Um, The, the defense spend, or the spend for defense goods in Europe is four to five times smaller than what it is in the US. So you take the US spend for defense goods, we are 20% of this, five times smaller, four to five times. And then you take that small slice, you have to cut it again because we're buying in Europe out of this small slice only 20 to 25%. The rest, the 80%, is procured outside of Europe, mainly from the US. And the US is mainly buying from the US. So when you look at what we're producing, designing and producing in Europe, it's what, 20% of 20%? How much is it? Five, four to five percent? And then on top, we don't have one system, like in the US, the US is buying one system for the United States. We are using this, to develop and buy national systems in most of the cases. It's a miracle that we're still alive. <laughs> no, but seriously, why are we still alive? Because we're using some tricks. First, we cooperate. So we, we manage some time to bundle forces together. Well, that remains the exception. We are a bit this exception because at Airbus, what we do is what we do together in terms of different systems. Second, we're using another very powerful trick, which is duality. We develop systems, uh, technologies, bricks, that can be used for both commercial, civil, and military. One example is the MRTT, the tanker. It's an A330, result of a cooperation, that is militarized, duality, and we use the third trick, we export. Without export, we don't have the scale. Well, we're not necessarily as good as the US in export, but still, that's a way to increase scale. And the advice I would I would give, or it's not an advice, I mean the call is for Europe to come together on defense. That's the only way forward. Why are we not doing it at scale? Because security and defense remains a national sovereignty. As if we would still prepare for going at war against each other. Let's be clear. Well, that's not what we do, fortunately. But if we would really think defense of Europe, we would come together as Europeans And then we would have the scale that is similar to what the U.S. are doing, or maybe with a smaller budget, but we would overcome what I said before. So the first priority is to buy European. The second priority, or the first priority, is also to buy together, and therefore to specify together. Well, um, in a word, think European for defense and security, and less national. But it's a very challenging task for head of states, How can you say to your voters, well, we will abandon part of the national sovereignty on security and defense and give it to Europe? How do you do this today? But if you don't do it, we will remain a very small player in this world, and that's no good news for the security and the defense of Europe. So I really believe we need to do more together as Europeans in defense, 
or we will continue to go down and, and disappear from that world. And that would be really bad news for uh, the ability of Europeans to decide of their own future, of what they want to do, how they want to behave. Last question. The very last question, um, do you have only one sentence? Um, and it's a complicated question. Yes or no? Um, a sentence, sentence, several words. Uh, there's a third um, area, space, which you are really active in. It used to be the, the um, largest provider of civilian um, um, space technology. So seven years ago already, you had the Tesla moment because SpaceX, founded by a guy called Elon Musk, surpassed Ariane Spass, and since then you're building this Ariane 6 rocket. Uh, and it delayed, and again delayed. Now, now it's rolling to the starting point, this, uh, and I think uh, this summer you maybe have a launch. So last question, will we see a launch this year of Ariane 6? Well, yes or no? I think I can answer, yes. yes. Thanks. Yes. Thank, you, thank you very much. <laughs>